Hello, and welcome to the ninth episode of Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. MacDonald. In this episode, we're going to be reading the section of the despisers of the body in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And it's going to be building upon the idea of the body affecting our ideas of the self and our individuality and personality. And this follows on from the previous episode where we looked at the psychology and psychological makeup and profile of a virtuous individual and those philosophers and individuals who create concepts of the afterlife and ideas of the afterlife as well. And what we'll be looking at, we're covering very briefly uh, history and looking into this focus on the mind that philosophy has in Descartes in his book Meditations on First Philosophy and the concept of the I and also in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit with that concept of spirit. And we'll be contrasting this with is Nietzsche's focus on the body, his relation to Schopenhauer, very brief discussion of what the will is, and then we'll have a quick look at Kant's aesthetics view and how all that fits into things as well. So let's get cracking of the despisers of the body. I wish to speak to the despisers of the body. Let them not learn differently nor teach differently, but only bid farewell to their own bodies and so become dumb. I am body and soul. So speaks the child. And why should one not speak like a child? But the awakened, the enlightened man says, I am body entirely and nothing beside. And the soul is only a word for something in the body. The body is a great intelligence, a multiplicity with one sense, a war and a peace, a herd and a herdsman. So straight from the get-go, we have Nietzsche being critical of the way in which organized religion views the world as being childlike and simplistic. And he's saying here, of course, that's not an incorrect way you can view things, but it is one in which you negate or deny the much more complex and scientific explanation for things. And so you can go into the clash between the ideas of the origins of the universe, for instance, where you can have creationism on the one hand as a very simplistic view of things where God creates the world. Or you can go to the scientific view, which is much more complex, of the whole Big Bang theory. And it's also here the lack of acceptance of the death of God for the religious people here in organized religion's view that they accept a simplistic way of things. Don't they know that God is dead? And so we have the awakened man or the enlightened man being that more modern view, let's say, in which we have an explanation for why things occur in the world, why things are, rather than seeking a purely spiritual or religious explanation for that. Interestingly enough as well, when he says... The soul is only a word for something in the body. It draws a really strong connection with Aristotle's view of the soul. And Aristotle's view there is in his book called De Anima, in which Aristotle precisely argues that the soul is something that's inseparable from the body. And when the body dies, the soul dies. Why is this the case? Because in Aristotle's view, the soul is the principle of animation within the body, or the first principle of animation, as he says. It causes the body to be alive and animated. And so when the body is dead, it's no longer animated. Why is that the case? Because the principle of animation has also died. And it's also quite interesting there just to think of the way in which the very idea of the soul we're very much conditioned into the acceptance of this spiritual entity, the sort of spiritual or ghost-like copy of you that'll then leave your body and then go into the afterlife. And of course, that's only just one idea of what the soul is here. Continuing on then, 
Your little intelligence, my brother, which you call spirit, is also an instrument of your body, a little instrument and toy of your great intelligence. You say I, and you are proud of this word, but greater than this, although you will not believe in it, is your body and its great intelligence, which does not say I, but performs I. What the sense feels, what the spirit perceives, is never an end in itself, but sense and spirit would like to persuade you that they are the end of all things. They are as vain as that. Sense and spirit are instruments and toys. Behind them still lies the self. The self seeks with the eyes of the sense. It listens too with the ears of the spirit. The self is always listening and seeking. It compares, subdues, conquers, destroys, it rules, and is also the ego's ruler. So there's quite a lot to unpack just in that little section. We have the word spirit, which is in the German Geist, and that word in itself has a very strong relation into the philosophy of Hegel, who wrote the big book Phenomenology of Spirit, and the word Geist can be translated into either meaning spirit, or mind, and then we have seemingly a very quick and subtle reference in there to Descartes because of the use of the word of the I, capital I. So very briefly then, in the meditations, Descartes arrives at this idea of the I through the very famous line, cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. And so the best way to understand exactly how do we arrive at this point and exactly what does Descartes mean by the I is through his example of the wax and melted wax. So what he does in the second meditation is that he takes this piece of wax and he melts it. And then comes the question, how do we know it's the same piece of wax? Because through our experience, we don't know it's the same piece of wax. Why is this the case? Because on the one hand, it was solid, had fragrance, and on the other, it's more liquidy and has lost all its fragrance. So we can possibly know it's the same piece of wax from our sensory experience because we're dealing with two different objects completely. And the same could apply to any experiential object. And the problem is, how do you know it's the same object over time? And you could apply it to trees. If you see a tree in full bloom, and then over a series of like several years, it decays, how would you know it was the same tree from your experience? And so Descartes reaches the conclusion, it's not from our experience that we know it's the same object, but rather it's through our mind. Because our mind is able to identify and reflect upon the qualities that make the object the same over time. An example of that is the way in which in all waxes, they would be mutable, is the posh way to put it, or precisely subject to change from being solid into a liquid. And the deep point here is that we can apply this precisely to ourselves as a model because how do we know who we are from our experience over time is going to be precisely our mind and that point of the I is going to be always the same so regardless of the fact that we change from an infant into a teenager into an adult and then someone who's elderly and so forth what always remains the same over time is that I and what exactly does this mean, is he says, when it says, I think, therefore I am, it means that we are a collection of thought processes and different collections of thought over time that remain the same. An example that he gives is when we affirm, deny, or will. And on the other hand, we have the relation into Hegel through the phenomenology of spirit, his big book in which he, like Descartes, problematizes our experiential knowledge and our scientific way of viewing things, in which the book 
is a whole movement of towards in which the mind is precisely the thing that we understand the world is the framework or in posh terms the ideology that's placed upon things that allows us towards a more correct understanding of things and here we see a very close relation from Nietzsche into Schopenhauer where Schopenhauer argues that precisely everything is dependent upon the will as he says with a big W and there's a great quote here by exactly what does will mean from the Encyclopedia of Philosophy at Stanford's website so plato.stanford.edu and it says here for Schopenhauer this is not the principle of self-consciousness and rationally infused will but is rather what he simply calls will a mindless aimless non-rational impulse at the function of our instinctual drives and at the foundational being of everything Schopenhauer's originality does not reside in his characterization of the world as will or act for we encounter this position in Fichte's philosophy but in the conception of will as being devoid of rationality or intellect and so we have this contrast that is set up then of on the one hand we had traditionally within philosophy and Descartes and Hegel this move towards a logical and rational explanation for things based upon our mind and then in Schopenhauer and in Nietzsche we have this move towards this non-rational instinctual drive and bodily impulse that affects how we think and affects our rationality and so this is a very deep point because it's arguing for a reversal in the history of philosophy and a move towards the opposite way that is traditionally we have the role of reason playing as safeguard that dominates and controls our body acts as a gatekeeper and we can gain control of our desire through our use of reason and rational reflection but Schopenhauer and Nietzsche are going to argue the opposite way around in which to say well actually no how we think is actually determined by our instinctual drives and forces that are running through our body that is a thing that's going to affect how we think and an example where our bodies affect our idea of self is through Schopenhauer's example where we find a romantic partner so on one level we think we're very much in control of what we find attractive but Schopenhauer argues what we actually find attractive is based upon our own instinctual needs and drives and desire to find good breeding stock basically a good breeding partner where we can produce the best offspring with them so this is what the next little section is going to discuss this tension between the self and this instinctual drive that's moving through the body continuing on then behind your thoughts and feelings my brother stands a mighty commander an unknown sage he is called self he lives in your body he is your body there is more reason in your body than in your best wisdom and who knows for what purpose your body requires precisely your best wisdom yourself laughs at your ego and its proud leapings what are these leapings and flights of thought to me it says to itself a byway to my goal i am the ego's leading string and i prompt its conceptions the self says to the ego feel pain thereupon it feels and gives thought how to end its suffering and it is meant to think just for that purpose the self says to the ego feel joy thereupon it rejoices and gives thought how it may often rejoice and it is meant to think just for that purpose i want to say a word to the despisers of the body it is their esteem that produces this disesteem 
What is it that created esteem and disesteem and value and will? The creative self created for itself esteem and disesteem. It created for itself joy and sorrow. The creative body created spirit for itself as a hand of its will. So here we have the notion of the self getting control over our bodily desires, or as Nietzsche is saying here, the ego. And it should be thought of here, and not in the Freudian idea of ego, but much more related back into that idea of instinctual drives. The way in which Nietzsche is saying here, the self wants the body to feel pain, feel joy, is ultimately just to have a positive mental state about things. And it's through this desire for wanting a positive mental state about things that ultimately then the whole esteem, disesteem, value, judgment system is all set in place upon the body, when the body itself is not something that's either good or bad, it's just a process that's occurring through us. That is to say, our instinctual drives are not something that's either good or bad. It's just simply a process. And so in this last little section, we're going to have Nietzsche then say, well, this model that is placed upon the body, this one that focuses upon the spies in our own body through its focus on an afterlife and a metaphysics, it's still all very much dependent upon the body in itself. It goes back into the previous section of you ingrates. Precisely your body that gives you pleasure and joy, and yet it's your very body that is the thing you want to escape from. Continuing on, even in your folly and contempt, you despisers of the body, you serve yourself. I tell you, yourself itself wants to die and turn away from life. Yourself can no longer perform that act which it most desires to perform, to create beyond itself. That is what it most wishes to do. That is its whole ardour. But now it has grown too late for that, so yourself wants to perish, you despisers of the body. Yourself wants to perish, and that's why you become despisers of the body. For no longer you are able to create beyond yourselves, and therefore you are now angry with life and with the earth. An unconscious envy lies in the sidelong glance of your contempt. I do not go your way, you despisers of the body. You are not bridges to the superman. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So it's that ironic point, really, in which to say any metaphysical model or one which we have an argument for the afterlife is still all based upon the underlying relation back into our instinctual drives and body itself through wanting to get control over it. And really, it's that point in which you say, well, you can't precisely create anything beyond yourselves because everything always comes back to the body again and also whenever we have the idea of creating beyond ourselves we can always go into aesthetics as an example of that where in art there's that great argument that everything that is truly artistic is beautiful and if it's beautiful it's completely devoid of any relation whatsoever into our bodily desires. And the philosopher who argues for this point is Immanuel Kant. And Kant argues for this point in his book, The Critique of Judgment. And the concept that he comes up with and argues for is that of disinterest. In order to be a piece of art in Kant's view, it has to be completely of disinterest, complete disinterestedness. And so we have a really easy example as well, in which you have a nice serene landscape as being free from any sort of form of bodily desire, as being beautiful, and that would all fit nicely into Kant's theory. But on the other hand, Nietzsche completely disagrees with Kant's view, because of course we have that wonderful line as well from Zarathustra, you cannot create beyond yourselves. And we have this direct relation into Kant's aesthetic theory in Nietzsche's book on the genealogy of morals. And a little quote from section 6 here. When our aestheticians tirelessly rehearse in support of Kant's view, 
that the spell of beauty enables us to view even nude female statues disinterestedly, we may be allowed to laugh a little at their expense. The experiences of artists in this delicate matter are rather more interesting. Certainly Pygmalion was not entirely devoid of aesthetic feeling. Pygmalion was a sculptor in ancient Greek mythology who fell in love with the statue that he carved. And so Nietzsche's argument is that no art can be disinterested. Rather, everything has interest or a relation into our desire. And the example he uses is a really good one. Whenever we view nude statues or nude women and paintings and so forth, there's an incredible amount of relation into the desire of the artist themselves. And what I mean here is you can see the way in which the artist creates the nude has a relation back into his psychological makeup and to what he finds as an attractive female. And an example can be seen in the famous work Venus of Urbino by Titian, which was created in 1534. And in that painting, we have a woman that is laying down quite gracefully there, looking directly into the viewer's eyes and having one hand to sort of idly by her hip. And it's argued to be a work completely free from any sort of sensuality, any sexual desire whatsoever, and is argued to be, and Roger Scruton has argued for this point from Kantian view, that there's absolutely nothing sexual going on whatsoever in Titian's work. But from the Nietzschean perspective, we can say, well, actually, you can see the way in which Titian's own idea about what a beautiful woman is and what is beautiful about the very form and figure of the woman in and itself works on an unconscious level to say, well, then there is a form of sexual desire going on within the painting. Thank you very much for listening to the episode. In the next episode, we'll be continuing our reading of Nietzsche's Zarathustra. We'll be reading the sections and discussing of the joys and passions and of the pale criminal. Feel free to drop me an email at dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com and I can also be found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. Thank you very much for listening and I'll hope you'll join us next time.